So, prophecy, what is prophecy? Well, if we go to Strong's and look up in the Old Testament Hebrew, it says a prediction. So, we go to the Old Testament and look up in Strong's and it says a prediction. And we go and look in Strong's and New Testament for prophecy and it says exactly the same, a prediction. Being able to say what is going to happen. The point about Bible predictions is that this is God predicting. This is not man predicting. This is not President Trump or Mrs. May saying, this is what I want to do, and then finding as they go through their everyday life that the things they want to do, they can't do because so many things happen that are outside their control. Nothing is outside the control of our God. He has all power. What he wants to happen will happen. And so when he makes predictions, we know that they will come to pass. Uh, and God says that prophecy is a witness that he is the great God. So this is from Isaiah chapter 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. And we know how Paul in Hebrews says that God, in sundry times, different ways, different times, spake by the fathers, unto the fathers, by the prophets. God entrusted his word to the prophets. The prophets then spoke that word to his people. Uh, and God ensured that men of all generations would be able to trust the prophets because he gave short-term prophecies and long-term prophecies so that men like Isaiah and Daniel that we read from, Ezekiel, they all talked about things that were going to come to pass very shortly and when they came to pass, then you knew that that was true. And when they talked about things that lay way into the future, we can be equally certain that they will come to pass. And so Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. And he calls it, it's a light, it's a searchlight. It enables us to see into the future, to know what is going to happen. And that's something wonderful. Because this is God's word, and it will come to pass. Unto a light, as unto a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And it is indeed a spotlight. And uh, a week ago I was talking after Bible class to some of our young brethren at Rugby, and we were talking about Mr. Trump's declaration about Jerusalem. And one of the young brethren says, you know, it's like reading a book and knowing what's in the next chapter. Because we do know what's in the next chapter. We know that there's going to be a great time of trouble for Jerusalem. All nations are going to come against it. Uh, and there is a time when Israel as a nation are going to be broken. They've got to be humbled because they trust in themselves. But by the word of God, we're able to see just what is going to happen. We don't know all the details, and God uses surprising ways to perform what he wants. But we live in such exciting times, young people. So many things are happening that we can see the hand of God, the angels working behind the scenes, bringing about God's will and purpose. So that was the test of the prophet, that if it doesn't come to pass, then we know he's not a true prophet. But we know that the prophecies we have in the word of God are God's true prophets. We can trust them. This is God's living word. And God very graciously has chosen to give us this guidebook. We have no excuse. Here is the book that God has given us to tell us of what is going to happen. And this is a book we can love cherish and trust because it is a book of truth and Jesus says you know you're my friends I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the book of Revelation he unfolds history 
as far as the believers were concerned. 2,000 years of history condensed in this one book. Things that he had heard from his father, he revealed to John, and John recorded them, that brothers and sisters of all ages, and we in this far off time, might be assured that this word of God is true and trustworthy. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things that must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So this is a slide that we're going to be looking at in quite a number of our talks as we go through the week. And this is where the exact phrase of our title occurs, but because we're going to have this reading tomorrow, uh, we had the one from Daniel chapter 4, which has a very similar expression. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And that phrase, a God in heaven, is a very interesting phrase. It doesn't occur many times in scripture. And it's always used of Gentiles, addressed to Gentiles. First occurrence is way back in Genesis, when Abraham uh, speaks to Eliezer of Damascus about getting a son for Isaac. Eliezer was a Gentile in the service of Abraham. So that's the first occurrence. It talks about the God of heaven will guide you on your journey and give you success. And the next occurrence is at the end of uh, Chronicles, uh, the time of Cyrus and the return of the Jews. And again, let's turn to it, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36. He uses this uh, phrase, the God of heaven. Right at the end of the book. And uh, verse 23, last verse. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. And he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Who is there among you of all his people? Yahweh his God be with him, and let him go up. So the God of heaven, here is Gentile, acknowledging because of his dealings with Daniel, who has shown him the prophecies about himself, uh, how Isaiah had spoken 120 years earlier about Cyrus. Um, there was his name written in the book of Isaiah. And this so impressed King Cyrus that he recognised that there was a God in heaven. They worship gods on earth. But there is a God in heaven who has control of all things. And when we come to Ezekiel and Nehemiah and Daniel and Jonah, there's a little reference in Jonah, these people talking in Gentile times, this is a phrase that's extensively used. And then finally, if we just turn to Revelation, uh, there are just two occurrences in the book of Revelation of this phrase, the God of heaven, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 13. Did you see if we get 13, not 13, 11, 11, 13. Um, the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell, referring to the French Revolution. Uh, men slain, men affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. They acknowledged that there was a greater God than the gods that they worshipped. And again in chapter 16, which is a chapter we will be looking at uh, several times in uh, verse 11, uh, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. So we worship the God of heaven. There's nobody greater than he. He is the one who has revealed himself through this word. So I just want to look at two prophecies. And the first is, so if we're in Revelation, just go back to chapter 14. It's up on the screen, but follow it in your Bibles. And this is a section telling us what the gospel is going to be that the Lord Jesus preaches when he comes back. Now, in the setting of Revelation chapter 14, the Battle of Armageddon has taken place. 
the Russian army that have been destroyed on the mountains of Israel and the European armies that have been helping them have been destroyed. The Lord Jesus has revealed himself to his nation, uh, Zechariah chapter 12. They have been baptised into Christ in the springing water that springs out from Jerusalem when the great earthquake takes place. They will be in Christ. The twelve apostles will be sorting out the Jews among their different tribes uh, and looking after their affairs. And the Lord Jesus will have set himself up as King of the Jews. And the declaration will be made that the Lord Jesus is not just king of the Jews. He is king of the world. And in Abraham and in his seed shall all nations be blessed. So the call is going to go out to all the nations. That this man who is claiming to be Israel's Messiah as king in Jerusalem. He is God's son. You have to submit to him. Now, it's the significance of the gospel that Revelation tells us that is going to be preached in that day, which I think is so fascinating, because this was written nearly 2,000 years ago. So what is the gospel that's going to be preached when Jesus comes back? He, he tells us in verse 7, Fear God, Give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The very thing that men and women refuse to acknowledge. They attribute to evolution the bringing about of the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters they refuse to see a hand of a god so how wonderful that the lord jesus knew two thousand years ago that the challenge that is appropriate for this generation is there is a god who has created everything this is his son you've got to submit to him the one that made heaven and earth and everything so the very thing that man sets up as a pinnacle today, that evolution has brought about everything, time and chance, man is at the top of a pinnacle, uh, there is no right or wrong, we're free to do what we like because there is no God, we prove that there is no God, that evolution is true. This is going to be the appropriate challenge. And brothers and sisters and young people especially, this is the challenge that is being made to you today by the world around us. The world is saying, you don't believe the Bible, do you? Yes, we do. We reject the teaching of evolution. They claim that is science. But it's not, it's their religion. We have no qualms with science per se. Chemistry and physics all point to a wonderful God who's made mathematical laws, scientific laws. So you can perform uh, an experiment in Moscow, in Vancouver, or Toronto, anywhere you like, uh, and you'll get the same results. But what they mix up is that the world of evolution isn't science. That's just man's deductions of things that he sees. And depending upon the glasses that we wear, we either see this evidence and say, well, yes, there's the evidence of the flood. The Bible told us that there was a flood. And here is the evidence for it with all the fossils and death and destruction and decay. But man looks at it and says, no, 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 no. This is, this is the evolution of life. This has taken millions of years. Absolutely no proof at all. And we have to appreciate, young people, that what the world says is true, isn't true. It's a lie, it's falsehood. And we can have complete confidence from the very first pages of Genesis that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the God of heaven. He has revealed himself through this word. 
and we can have supreme confidence in it. So there's a wonderful prophecy given 2,000 years ago and we can see the appropriateness of that challenge to the world today. So, yes, Genesis 26, uh, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. And that will happen and it will be a time of wonderful blessing. And it's a great test of our faith because we're different. We will be ridiculed. We will have to stand on our own. But the evidence is there. There are lots of people who aren't Christadelphians who believe as passionately as we do in the Genesis accounts, who are equally qualified in the fields of science that they study and see the abundant evidence but in the complexity of the life that they see that this couldn't possibly have evolved. And there is no evidence for one thing changing into another. They, they cannot bring forth any evidence at all for evolution. They can show that species adapt to circumstances, which is, shows a wonderful creator. But that's not evolution. So that, that's one of the wonderful things, that the word of God is true. We can trust it. Once we begin to question, once we begin to tear out Genesis chapter 1, then the whole of the Bible collapses. It all holds together in a wonderful harmony. 